2007. Uh, Willie's Yellow House in the, at the base of the Catskill Mountains where the solitary guru stays in his cave and does his paintings and his readings and I heard about the passing of Joe. I remember Joe Schaefer from the flight deck at the VA hospital many many years ago though I hadn't seen him since those early days on the flight deck, Joe and I were, I guess, the organizers of a lot of the stuff that took place there. But I wanted to say a goodbye poem to Joe. And this goodbye poem is from a World War I poet. Remember the war to end all wars? His name was Wilfred Owen. And this sonnet called Anthem for Doomed Youth was the last letter he wrote before he was killed by a machine gun bullet along the Sambre Canal in France, November 4th, a couple of weeks before the armistice. And when his mother received the letter with the sonnet in there, Anthem for Doomed Youth, the first thing Wilfred had wrote was, Dear Mom, my subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. And this is the sonnet that was included there. Many people consider it the greatest sonnet ever for veterans of any war. Anthem for Doomed Youth by Wilfred Owen. What passing bells for these who die as cattle? Only the monstrous anger of the guns. Only the stuttering rifles rapid rattle can patter out their hasty horizons. No mockeries for them. No prayers nor bells nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells, and bugles calling for them from sad shires. But candles may be held to speed them all, not in the hands of boys, but in their eyes shall shine the holy glimmers of goodbyes. The pallor of girls' brows shall be their pall, their flowers, the tenderness of patient minds, and each slow dusk, a drawing down of blinds. God bless you, Joe, on your journey. I sure hope that uh, you're in Valhalla, and it's a Marine reporting, and I hope they're treating you real good up there, brother. So long. See you soon. See you soon. Tell us what you're doing, and we're running live now. Uh, I just put Beethoven's late quartets on, which I love to paint to. 
because the late quartets, Beethoven was deaf. And they're the last things he did before he passed away. They got not a requiem quality to them, but Vietnam vets can sure understand it. So these are Beethoven's late quartets. I like the paint to the quartets. Is that loud enough? Okay. 19 years of work. I first started out as a writer. I, it took me self-taught as a writer, self-taught as a painter and stuff, but after my book was published, Remain Stories of Vietnam, I was introduced to modern art. I had taught myself to write and write that book. Well, I worked in heavy labor games, cement factories, railroad, whatever it took, but I kept the book going. Um, and then I was introduced to modern art in late 1988, after the book was out, and uh, um, I just really got interested in it. I couldn't tell the difference between a Picasso and a Van Gogh at the time, but now I know both of them so well I can identify their work and date it and tell you how they did. Um, so I've been working 19 years, and uh, I think I got over 500 works back there. And uh, about 24 days ago, I gave up color for the first time in 19 years. I put all my tubes of color away, and I just went with black. I guess maybe it's the way I feel with the Iraq war and what's going on. Oh, Jesus, all that crap, the environment. But I went to straight black, and I began a series of black and whites. And I was able to say what I wanted to say with the black and whites. And uh, so I don't care if all the rest of the stuff is destroyed, but I'd like to hold on to these black and whites somehow, but I'll work on that. Anyway, this is how I work. You're in my church, so I'm always alone here. And usually I sit down like this with some Beethoven on or something. I glance at the canvas. Now, I'm not a dipper and a dauber. Some people are what I call dip and daub painters. They dip and they daub and they dip and they daub. I'm not like that. I, I follow the abstract expressionists. So for me, the canvas is an arena in which I act. You know, it's an arena for battle. Uh, Picasso first did it in his work with the bullfights. He always had the matador against the bull. So the artist is the matador and this is the bull and uh, he can put up a hell of a fight. So I attack the canvas. I don't. Uh, I don't dip and daub. And I'm working in pure black, nothing else. My mixture, my special mixture. Nobody knows what it is. I usually use house painting brushes of various sizes. Sometimes big house painting brushes, and, which is what the abstract expressionists use. So my idea, mo most importantly, comes from from a. a great painter of the abstract expressionist and teacher, his name was Hans Hoffman. And for instance, one of the things he said was, if you put a line on the canvas, it's actually the fifth line, because you have the tension of the stretcher frame. And the minute I put a line there, I put a line here, or I put a line there, it creates a tension between what's called the negative space, and positive space is anywhere where the marks are made. And if you're working on something like battle or some of these, it's a battle between positive and negative space, quite literally between life and death. I mean, it's, it's, it is the struggle of life and death, especially with black. Picasso painted Guernica in black, the greatest painting of the 21st century. Um, so that's what I do, and I'm an abstract expressionist, so when I go up there, I'm trying to I try to talk, but you, I'm usually in silence, and I get into what's called a zone. And I work on what they did in the sense of Jungian archetypes, um, letting my unconscious take over and um, throw up its energy, and it'll usually come up in forms, archetypal forms, which Jung talked about in the unconscious. And it's also from the soul, so. One thing I do with these paintings is it keeps me in touch with my soul. You know, we're all ego bound. Everybody says to me, what's the battle of the 21st century? I say the battle of the 21st century is going to be between the ego and the soul. 
doesn't matter who it is, Bush, Putin, Abadijian, I don't give a shit who it is, me too. But it's a battle between the ego and the soul. The ego, I want, I must have, I must possess, I must... But the soul is what really makes us human. And society today, especially to run these corporations and get people spending their money on the malls and getting 30000 in debt and everything like that is... They got to feed the ego and cut the soul off, because the soul doesn't need a hell of a lot. It needs a little bit of food, needs shelter and clothing, but it doesn't need everything that the ego needs. So that's what I try to do. And uh, the battle this century will be between the ego and the soul. If the ego wins this century, our environment's gone. We will kill each other. We may end as a species on the face of the earth, and that scares the shit out of me with the children. I'm really taught, scared for the children. I mean, I'm old, I'm ready to go, I did my time, but I'm terrified for the children. So if the ego wins, we're going to be fighting, accumulating, whoever's got the most toys in the end wins, that kind of thing. And if we're able to open up to our souls, each and every person by themselves, opening up to their souls and blocking the ego, then maybe we'll learn to share things and not need quite as much. You know, 60% of us are obese and getting worse, and uh, the rest of the world is starving. So I think that's feeding the ego when your gut comes out to here. It's not the soul. Soul doesn't need any of that. Soul's got to travel light. Um, I sit in a chair, then I stand at the, oh, sorry, I stand at the easel to work, I don't, and I'm going to try to work here, but I don't know if I can talk. Let's see what happens. Cheap easel, man. Nothing fancy about this thing. But I've used it all along because I just don't need anything else. So what I'm doing now is I'm beginning to create lines, positive against negative. So already there's a tension set up in there. I guess it almost looks like a dancing figure of some sort. I'll put a head on it. How about this? Phew, there's a head. Well, you see, you're going to have sort of the sense of a dancing figure just from the gestures. But um, I'm going to keep going here a little bit. Not too bad, actually. It's starting to come along. Ugh. Let me know if you're recording. We're ready. Probably ended when I sat down, huh? No. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, anyway, well, for me, it's also catharsis. I mean, I suggest that certainly for vets with post-traumatic stress disorder to do these abstract expressionist gesture paintings and go at it because it lets a lot of energy out too. And uh, I used to be a fighter. I trained under Gus Camato. I had 28 fights, 125, lost three as a welterweight. But 